We're going live. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Lift off. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Skip Smith. Uh, I'm a partner here at Sherman and Howard. So welcome to Sherman and Howard. And thank you to our marketing people that are around here for uh, putting all this together, including a, a nice uh, hot breakfast for us. Um, I'm the uh, chair of the Sherman and Howard Space Law Practice Group. And uh, so uh, Sherman and Howard is very happy to, to host you here. But I'm, I'm thrilled that we have as a co-host the Secure World Foundation and a couple of people I want to recognize. One is Cinda. Cinda, could you just put your hand up a second there? All right. Thank you for uh, the support that you give to the Secure World Foundation and, and for supporting this program here today. And uh, Mike, my co-host over here, will be uh, doing a dog and pony show here in a moment on the uh, Outer Space Treaty and I'll, and I'll be introducing Mike. But raise your hand if you've ever read the Outer Space Treaty. Really? Okay, that's, that's a lot. Okay, I was thinking people were just here for a birthday party. <laughs> You've really actually read it. Okay, that's good. Uh, well, so we're going to talk today about the Outer Space Treaty and, and really what it's done for space business and Colorado space business. And, and I'm also thrilled that we had Mark Sarangelo with us from Sierra Nevada to talk about the Dream Chaser and, and, and other things they're doing there. Uh, so it's going to be a really good program, and as you see in the agenda, we're going to um, talk for about an hour, and um, and then discuss Q and A session and kick things around. And we, uh, the other speaker we have with us is Mike Gold over there. Mike, raise your hand, uh, and I'll introduce our speakers as as we get to them. But I, there's also one other person I have to introduce, and that's. My fiance, Dr. Pam Burge, is over there, uh, and and in four weeks from today we get married. So. <laughs> You're thinking it's pretty right. smart. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for coming, Pam. Uh, so uh, to kick it off, let me uh, let me introduce Michael. Um, Michael Simpson is the executive director of the Secure World Foundation, and he's been there for. How many years since 2011? Yeah, 2011. Long time. And then before that, he was the president of the International Space University um, for many years. So uh, Mike's been in, uh, living in the space world for a long time, space policy, space law. Uh, I run into Mike places all around the world, you know, and, uh, and he's very well known, and as is the Secure World Foundation. They're doing some marvelous things, uh, and Mike's providing some great leadership for that organization. So we're going to talk about the Outer Space Treaty. And uh, I'm going to start us off, and then we'll kind of go back and forth. But this is a list of the, the major space treaties. Now, um, these a lot of you know this, but some of you may not. But all of these have come out of the United Nations... Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Copius has a technical subcommittee and a legal subcommittee, and they meet periodically. And most of these treaties, all of these treaties really, some of them were uh, based on UN General Assembly resolutions, but then it usually goes to the legal subcommittee, gets discussed and drafted in there, approved by Copius, and then uh, approved by the United Nations and sent out for ratification to all the uh, nation states. And the number you see in parenthesis here is the number of nations who have ratified that treaty. So you see that the Outer Space Treaty has 105 countries around the world that have ratified this treaty and so it is very widely accepted sufficiently widely accepted that it really applies to all nations as customary international law because it's been so widely accepted for such a long time. Uh, so the Outer Space Treaty came first um, and only 10 years after Sputnik. So pretty quick. Then the next three treaties really 
further define some of the principles, the broad general principles that are in the Outer Space Treaty. So you had rescue and return of astronauts, liability convention, which is fairly detailed, uh, registration convention, all further defining aspects of the Outer Space Treaty. And we came to the Moon Agreement, which was a little different. Uh, some people say that it did further define provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. Many people say no, it's very different and we're not going to sign up for that. You see, only 17 nations have ratified the Moon Agreement. We're not going to go into all the reasons for that now, but it's, uh, it, it is not widely ratified. So we're going to talk now a little bit more about the Outer Space Treaty itself and focus on that. And Mike, why don't you elaborate on the very title of the, of the treaty? You know, one of the things I, I think that is often overlooked when we talk about the uh, Outer Space Treaty is that it is a treaty on principles. Uh, that so often people try to see this treaty as if it were, you know, like Title 10 U.S. Code or something like that. It, it, it really was an attempt to put down the very basic rules that would govern an environment in which states could operate in space peacefully. And so it is one of the shortest treaties that the United States has signed and ratified. Uh, it is uh, roughly the same length as the Antarctic Treaty, which is also essentially a principles treaty. And so right from the beginning, as we begin to talk, uh, really reviewing the uh, articles and the meaning of the Outer Space Treaty, understand that this is intended to be principles it's intended to be fulfilled by the law of states. It, 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 it's individual states that, uh, that adopt the laws that implement this treaty. Uh, this treaty is not world government. This treaty is an attempt on, uh, by countries to see a way that they can operate together in an environment sufficiently different from everything we know on planet Earth uh, to uh, require some special principles uh, to guide our uh, our actions and our um, uh, and our behavior, our legislative uh, decisions going forward. So, in that context, uh, let's uh, go back and start looking at the articles. And we start, of course, with Article One, uh, and fairly simple. All of these all of these articles are very simple. Uh, and Article One states exploration and use of of outer space should be carried out for the benefit and interests of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. Province of all mankind is very interesting language there because uh, there's some other treaties out there uh, that talk about the common heritage of mankind, which is a concept that is uh, advanced by developing countries that would give to them an equitable share of the benefits derived from uh, certain resources. You see the common heritage of mankind concept or, and, and specific language in the Moon Agreement that I mentioned a few minutes ago. The common benefits provision, and that's what this is often referred to as, you know, the province of all mankind, benefit of all, the benefit and interest of all countries. It's like kind of summarizes, oh, it's common benefits principle. And when you think about it, Outer space really has inured to the common benefit of all countries and really all people. I mean, there's almost no place you can go in the world where you can't communicate with just about any other place in the world via satellite. Okay? Even if it starts from your cell phone and, and goes to a cell tower and then may go, you know, landline to a microwave tower, ultimately it's probably going to beam up to a satellite and then beam down somewhere else. And you're going to be able to communicate anywhere in the world through uh, satellite communications. When you think about the benefits of remote sensing satellites uh, to all countries of the world, helping them from land planning to evaluating what resources might be in their countries, uh, all kinds of uses for remote sensing of the Earth from spaces. There's, there's so many applications uh, in addition to just the uh, advancement of science that we've seen that I, I have no trouble arguing that uh, outer space has been used for the common benefit 
of all mankind and all countries. It's an easy argument. Uh, the common heritage of mankind concept is a different argument. Frankly, uh, a lot of people like me, we don't even want to go there. You know, we don't want international regimes that dictate how the, the benefits derived from outer space activities are going to be allocated to all the countries in the world, um, you know, without perhaps even taking into account the gazillions of dollars that are spent to uh, do the exploration. So, very different concepts there. Common benefits, common heritage of mankind. Outer space treaties, just common benefits. We can live with that any day. Uh, Space shall be free for exploration and use by all states. That's the freedom of use principle. And, and uh, that's one of uh, my favorite principles in the Outer Space Treaty. You can do it, you know. If it doesn't violate one of the other principles, you can do it. And we've had many, uh, many examples of the freedom of use of outer space. So let's go to the next slide, Mike. Well, Outer Space Treaty was adopted in 1967, a very interesting time in the space race where neither the United States nor the Soviet Union uh, were sure of who was going to get to the moon first. And uh, it was not possible to have even a remotely military mind without seeing that the moon could be the new high ground. And so the treaty was adopted in an environment where the single, one of the single most important early purposes was to prevent claims of sovereignty of the kind that we saw in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries uh, as Europe began its era of uh, exploration. Uh, nobody wanted a flag planted on the moon to mean that a country had established sovereignty on the moon. And so this term national appropriation enters the language and then we resolve the technological issues that get us to the moon. Nobody tries to make a claim. Even the American flags that were planted on the moon were planted with language designed to say this is not a claim. Um, but then people started talking about appropriation as if it might relate to any taking of property. Uh, in fact, this treaty of principles requires us to go back and see that it was really national appropriation that people uh, were worried about. And they immediately say, uh, right afterwards, a no national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means, by use or occupation, sort of a bow to those of us in common law countries that understand that prescriptive, prescriptive rights in property can be possible. Um, and it has been an area of some controversial discussion. If there is a core understanding, however, of this, um, of this article, it is that it really was designed to make sure that nobody could claim that any celestial body was a part of their national territorial sovereignty. That was what the concern is. Understand that a very interesting aspect of the Outer Space Treaty is buried in here, and it continues to plague us. And that is, all of us that have either studied law, taught law, practiced law, have done so in an environment where there was a sovereign that had played a role in creating that law, either through the sovereign's courts or through the sovereign's legislature or through direct statements of the sovereign. We are in an environment in which we work to create law absent territorial sovereignty. So we, we struggle in a world where there is no sovereignty over territory, but there is sovereignty over person. And it, um, uh, for those of us like myself who've taught law, this has been an absolutely magnificent concept to bedevil the minds of students when you're trying to get them to understand uh, some of the implications of sovereignty. But keep it in mind, because many of the arguments over the Outer Space Treaty really focus on this issue that we have no sovereignty. Uh, we have nobody who can decree that a particular interpretation is accurate. The next point is that the moon and other celestial bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. The peaceful purposes portion of the Outer Space Treaty has held with incredible 
um, incredible strength. Uh, well, certainly space has been used to support military operations, but we have not had satellite on satellite or spacecraft on spacecraft violence, uh, and we haven't, um, uh, we haven't uh, seen it used as a, um, a battleground. Uh, there is an interesting issue buried here that we'll uh, see emerge as we uh, talk uh, further on, and that is the use of the term celestial bodies. Uh, that term is increasingly discussed in terms of not exactly knowing what a celestial body is. And it's not clear from the, 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 the travaux preparatoire, the work done before the treaty, what it was intended to mean. Does it mean every speck of dust in space? Does it only mean hydrostatically spherical bodies in space? Does it mean asteroids over a certain size? Does it mean all asteroids? Uh, the honest answer to all those questions is uh, we don't know. And uh, uh, it may be one of the biggest area of lacuna uh, that we cannot precisely define. Uh, we, we don't know when the Japanese brought back particles from um, uh, the uh, asteroid uh, uh, Itakawa. Uh, were they celestial bodies? Uh, when the United States brought back particles taken in the Genesis mission that were solar particles that had mass, were they celestial bodies? Um, we don't know. It um, wasn't considered important when the treaty was adopted, um, and there's never been case law. Uh, to define it. So, Article 2 and 4 have some fascinating pieces to them, uh, also fascinating questions. Article 5 talks about astronauts and it declares that they're envoys of mankind and that nations must render assistance to astronauts in distress. So, uh, rapidly after this uh, Outer Space Treaty came out, uh, nations were concerned about astronauts who might return to the surface of the earth in condition of distress, may not even make it into outer space or, or have problems coming back. And that's why the next treaty was the uh, agreement on the rescue and return of astronauts and space objects. And it further defined the principles in the Outer Space Treaty and it said, okay, if, out, if astronauts, and talking about who's an astronaut these days is, is also an interesting term because now we see personnel of spacecraft a little bit different but anyway you know in the treaties they talk about astronauts and so if astronauts return to the face of the earth under uh, conditions of distress nations must take all steps possible to rescue them and then must promptly return them to the uh, nation that set them up uh, if the space object returns to the uh, surface of the earth under conditions of distress it's a little bit different. You take all steps possible, uh, all, not all steps practicable. So all steps possible, all steps practicable. Uh, some people have said, well, it may not be practical if it costs too much money. So you may go to the state that set it up and said, uh, tell you what, you pay me $50 million, we'll go get it for you, or, or whatever. But it's, it's very different, be, you know, the uh, obligations uh, with respect to returning astronauts are quite different from the obligations uh, inherent in returning space objects. Article 6 is, is extremely important. States are responsible for national space activities, whether by governmental or non-governmental entities. And uh, Mike Gold is going to talk extensively about Article 6, so I'm going to leave this to Mike uh, to handle and throw it back to Michael Simpson, you got mics all over the place, right in front of me. So in fact, um, liability was an issue that was uh, very much on the minds of the drafters of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, obviously, there are substantial risks when you're dealing with uh, rockets, uh, launching them in some cases close to the frontiers with other states. And so Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty uh, indicated that states would be liable uh, for damage caused by their space objects. Uh, not a surprise, uh, international law is between states. Uh, they couldn't, uh, international law couldn't create a liability on a citizen of another state, only a state could do that. 
Um, but there were enough ambiguities in what was meant by that um, uh, article uh, that it led to the creation of an entire additional treaty, the liability uh, convention. Most important things to retain about the way we think in general about space uh, craft liability is that liability for damage caused on the ground by a space object um, authorized to be launched or even if launched from a country that had not uh, formally authorized it is absolute, absolute liability. It doesn't involve fault, it doesn't involve anything uh, that would uh, mitigate that liability, it's absolute liability. Liability for damage caused between space ob objects in space uh, is, um, um, is subject to determination of fault. And so uh, you, uh, you have two different concepts uh, of, the, um, uh, of the thinking about liability. Um, and uh, looking at the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Treaty uh, is an interesting exercise for those of you that want some nuance to this uh, concept of uh, liability. Uh, it is, by the way, one of the reasons why states pass space laws that require registration or, or licensing or approval of space missions because they have a liability. If the thing fails, um, the state will be held responsible by other states. Uh, this Article 8 deals with uh, jurisdiction and control, and it is interesting because states, when they retain jurisdiction and control of registered space objects, uh, have a different status than the status of, um, uh, say, maritime assets, uh, because uh, states can abandon a maritime asset. Uh, it's certainly well known in, um, in maritime law, you can have a derelict, you can have a vessel that simply is not under command, not under control, and states simply no longer have any capacity to deal with it. Uh, in that case, on maritime law, salvage can apply. Uh, salvage cannot apply directly in space because you can't have a derelict. I mean, technically a piece of debris <coughs> is a piece of the property of the state that launched it. Uh, it. It becomes one of the challenges we face as we try to come up with debris conventions that can reduce the amount of debris in orbit, is we have to find a way that we might be able to remove a non-cooperative object for which you have not gotten permission from the apparent owner, uh, because there are probably 40 of those objects that we would love to remove and dramatically reduce debris risk. But we don't have permission from the countries because they see a national interest still in protecting that property from being approached or uh, deorbited. Uh, uh, for example, the Russians argue that several proton rocket bodies are actively used for laser calibration. Uh, well, yeah, maybe, but they also happen to be in the way of a lot of other um, uses. So um, ownership is not affected by presence in space, uh, but in fact getting rid of your obligation to an object you launched is nearly impossible. Article 9, uh, states sir, shall avoid harmful contamination of space and celestial bodies, and there's a duty consult, to consult if your space activity may do so. Uh, so this is this is typically harmful contamination of space. Uh, let's say you know if we went to Mars and uh, had uh, biological material on board our space object that landed on Mars, we would never know after that if things we would discover on Mars would be native to that planet or perhaps as a result of our interference with that planet. There's also concern about back contamination coming back to the Earth from space. The, the duty to consult is, is basically if you could contaminate something or if you could, uh, if you could uh, harm somebody else's space activities, you need to uh, consult with them and, and make sure you're going to avoid that. We see that in, in great detail, for example, in the international telecommunication radio regulations that have you know thousands of pages of, of how you 
ensure you're going to avoid harmful interference in the radio frequency spectrum for satellites in the geostationary satellite orbit. So there's, there's other treaties that further define this, uh, but it's an important principle. And now kind of the, uh, the overall spin that we want to give to this, Michael. You know, keep in mind that at its most important function, the Outer Space Treaty really does provide a framework for um, the international environment, the legal, the regulatory, the cooperative environment uh, that um, uh, exists for the use of space, most, re most particularly Earth orbit, but increasingly with an effort to see it apply to cislunar space, and probably before too long to uh, the operation of spacecraft in the inner solar system at the very least. Uh, and so, um, to give you a, a, a tangible example, uh, my colleague uh, Ian Christensen and I uh, both uh, participate in a, a process called the uh, Hague Space Resources Governance Working Group. There is nothing in the Outer Space Treaty that uses, that, that directly addresses space mining. But because it's a treaty on principles, it almost the entire discussion in this international body that has academics, governments, and uh, business representatives ties back to the Outer Space Treaty. What can we do that's consistent, that doesn't violate the principles, that makes an industry possible, that permits benefit? You can't have benefit if you don't have development. And um, the way in which the Outer Space Treaty has governed that discussion is really very interesting, since several of the members of that committee come from countries who are uh, ratifiers of the Moon Treaty. But it's the Outer Space Treaty that is driving the, that discussion because of its role, as Skip says, as a customary, as a customary source of international law. Um, so that, the way that impacts individual countries and businesses is through municipal law, through domestic legislation. Uh, over 25 countries have passed laws that deal with the way their nationals will interact with space. Um, uh, probably the strictest of those laws is the French law. The U.S. is pretty close. Uh, there are laws that are a little bit less comprehensive, like Luxembourg's. It deals very much with orbit, very little with launch. Um, and, but the important thing is that countries are implementing the principles through their national law. Um, and when people ask about our commercial spacecraft competitiveness, uh, space like competitiveness act, uh, I often point out that you know the U.S. is doing what it's required to do. Uh, complain, if you will, about some of the regulations they might have included in that law, but they are required to regulate. They, they, the fact that they don't have an international consultation for each legislative piece is built into the law. Countries are supposed to do that. And so the Outer Space Treaty increasingly now is being reflected in space law. Um, I think one of the most recent countries to announce that it will have one by the end of the year is the United Arab Emirates. And so more and more countries are recognizing that this obligation, when you tie liability, uh, registration, and the fact that states are required by the Outer Space Treaty to authorize the actions of their nationals, you need a piece of legislation. And so that's what they're doing. Yeah, and uh, I, I got a doctorate in space law from the <coughs> Institute of Air and Space Law at McGill. My, my doctoral advisor was Dr. Ram Jakku, which some of you in this room may know. Uh, Ram's a prolific author, <laughs> to say the least. And he wrote a book, uh, edited a book, on uh, the national space law. So it's really, I've got it on my shelf. It's good to have. And there's over 20 countries in there, you know, countries you'd expect like Russia and China and Japan, but many countries that you wouldn't expect, like mentioned Luxembourg, you know. Uh, so it's a, it's a great book uh, to get if, if you want to look at national space laws in other countries. This is our last slide on outer space treaties, and, and it, it, kind of the bottom line is it has allowed commercial uses to flourish. It hasn't stifled or prohibited any of them. And without the Outer Space Treaty, what, what do you have out there for, for laws in outer space? 
and we'll, I'm sure in the discussion period or, or later today we'll, we'll get it. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit. But Mike Gold and I were at the Rockies game last night, and we were talking about a piece of legislation that's pending in the House right now, and it's got a section in there asking for a report. Uh, about whether the United States should withdraw from the Outer Space Treaty. And we were saying, this is absurd. You know, who are the staffers? I mean, who are the people that are, are calling for this? There's absolutely no reason for that. You, you get rid of the Outer Space Treaty, we got nothing, you know? I mean, it's, it's very broad in general, but it gives us a framework, you know? So, I, I, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll kick that around a little bit in the discussion period. Yeah, China's planning to land on the uh, far side of the moon next year. I, I'd hate to think that that became territorial uh, right. possession. Right, yeah, they'll plant their flag and, yeah. and at least claim that half of it. You know? but, uh, so the, uh, there's a tension between freedom of use and non-appropriation. The latest manifestation of that tension is mining in space. And, and Mike and I were at, in, in Vienna at the uh, UN uh, Legal Subcommittee on Copious a month and a half ago or so, and that was a big issue there. They had a special program on it there. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into it in this forum, but it's it's a it's an issue that people are talking about, even though it's like decades before we're really going to be able to do that. And we were laughing at that last night. You know, you got to give these space lawyers and, and academics something to talk about, <laughs> something to write about. You know, so so that's the Outer Space Treaty, uh, broad overview. And now we're going to bring Mike up. Uh, Mike Gold. Mike Gold is Vice President of Washington Operations and Business Development for Space Systems Morale. Uh, he's been involved in the space business for, for decades. Um, uh, I, you know, he's, he's a wonderful speaker and we're, we're thrilled to, uh, that Mike uh, agreed to fly in from Washington, D.C. and he's got a busy schedule. but. Mike speaking today, not as his uh, position from SSL, but really as his position as the chair of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, or ComStac as we call it, and he's going to give us some uh, valuable insight on what's going on in ComStac, and uh, Mike, do you want to talk from over here or there? Sure. Where would you like? You got it. Yeah, they wait there. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So thank you so much, Skip. Thank you to Secure World Foundation, to Sherman Howard, and to all of you for showing up for this. I, I mean, people who show up to hear about the Outer Space Treaty and space law before 8 a.m. <laughs> I don't know whether to congratulate or condemn you, but God bless you all. You're an amazing, amazing group. And please remind me to be more careful when I tell Skip during Rockies games. <laughs> all off the record. <laughs> Stay at the Rockies. But, uh, it's a wonderful introduction, and thank you so much for that rundown of the Outer Space Treaty. It's just great to hear a, a real understanding of what's occurring. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, I chair the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, and what I wanted to share with you today is certainly the interactions that I've had uh, with COPUS, with the Outer Space Treaty, uh, as chair of the ComStack, and also give you a view as to how this regulatory environment and the treaty is playing in the real world for commercial space activities, particularly innovative activities, that are coming up. So, without any further ado, we are in an era of extraordinary change in the commercial space industry. And I think it would be fair to say there's never been a more exciting time to be in commercial space, whether it's the introduction of space tourism, of asteroid mining, of commercial lunar rovers, private sector space stations. We are about to enter an age of wonders in space. But there is nothing more capable of stopping good technology than bad regulations and bad law. We all, as lawyers, understand that. And uh, I know I'm being video recorded, so I have to be careful what I say, but <laughs> You know, I, I always think that engineering is the easy part. That I have complete faith that our you know, engineers and technical folks can pull this off. The legal, the regulatory, the financial aspects, that's the difficulty. So it's really you, the attorneys, uh, I think, that have the real rocket science in terms of getting all of this to work. And just to give an example from my day job at Space Systems Loral, because uh, I think this really shows where the rubber hits the road with the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, we are entering a new era also in the satellite world. 
where previously you would purchase a satellite for a certain amount of money, it gets launched, uh, and 10 or 15 years later when it runs out of fuel, you throw it away. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. What we're going to be doing is utilizing robotic spacecraft that will refuel, refurbish, repair satellites on orbit. So uh, a whole new era of this. There are two government programs that are ongoing right now in this arena. One is NASA's Restore-L, which will demonstrate that a robotic spacecraft can refuel a satellite. I mean, that's to sell. We build satellites to last. I mean, this, you're never going to run into, hopefully, a mechanical issue. It's always, you're at least usually running out of fuel. That's the problem. And Restore-L is going to solve that. That's a NASA mission. It's a LEO mission. And the other mission is DARPA's RSGS, the Robotic Servicing of Geosynchronous Satellites. That's a GEO mission. And the idea there is even more complex. Well, we use robotic arms to repair a broken satellite, or better yet, to replace components so that you're not flying old technology. Uh, again, seismic shifts here in the industry that will be very, very exciting. However, get back to the role that bad regulations can play. And forgive me for dragging out this old chestnut. I think many of you can sing along to this story at the time. But as those of you know, you know, I've had some experience with the international traffic and arms regulations and the pernicious nature of those regulations, at least as they were quite a while ago. But history tends to repeat itself. So forgive me if I remind us of our experiences with ITAR. Uh, in my previous job with Bigelow Aerospace, we were launching uh, our spacecraft on the Dnieper, which is a converted Russian SS-18 nuclear missile. So extraordinarily efficient thing to do economically. You remove the warhead, put on a commercial fairing, and you're good to go. Rockets already built. SS-18, I believe, was designated Satan by NATO back in the day. So, <laughs> a lot of fun there. And uh, we were launching, actually, out of an active Russian nuclear missile base in Siberia. So after shuffling back and forth between there two years, I never complained about the weather in D.C. or Denver. It was an extraordinary experience. And look, when you're launching from an active Russian nuclear missile base with a nuclear missile, you expect there to be some export control issues. But it was the breadth and the depth of the ITAR that really shocked us in the end. And you know, the words that we were under was government supervision with the export controls. So when I would go over to Russia, be myself, a bunch of our engineers, and we would be sitting across the table from a dozen former members of the you know, Communist Party, right, Gargarian Communists. But he brought an alien into that room and said, point to the free country and point to the post-communist, whatever you want to call Russia. They would have pointed to the Russians as the free country because we as Americans were traveling with not one, but two Department of Defense monitors who were you know, bringing down our necks, watching every single word that we would say, and worse yet, we were paying for the privilege to the tune of $150 per hour, per monitor, plus room and board, plus overtime. We dropped somewhere between three hundred to $400,000 in direct fees to the government, probably well over a million dollars per mission on compliance alone with ITAR. I would joke with the Russians that the KGB may have spied on you back in the day, but at least they had the good courtesy to do it for free. <laughs> And it's not the export controls I would mind so much if there was technology worth that kind of protecting. And while, yes, we had proprietary systems, but uh, as the famous Norm Augustine once said, you want to do surgery with a scalpel, not with a chainsaw. And probably the best example of this, what the famous one is what we call the Genesis Tech Stand. And this was simply a stand that was built to prevent the spacecraft from lying on the ground. It was round with a few legs sticking out. Uh, if you flipped it upside down, you couldn't tell the difference between that and a metal coffee table. You know, nice tablecloth, some cutlery, indistinguishable from a metal coffee table. Yet we had to have two guards watching that coffee table on a full-time <laughs> basis and then have two Department of Defense officials watching the guards watch the coffee table. <laughs> now, I can only imagine the national security repercussions of this table technology leaking out <laughs> from the Russians to the Chinese or the Iranians, where you could, solve, you, know, you could serve coffee or even, worst case scenario, even tea. So our problem with export control was not that we were trying to protect technologies. We agree that there are certainly critical technologies that need to be protected. But table technology is not one of them. And this is the problem you can run into when regulations are taking too far, are implemented poorly. It can really hurt 
innovation, entrepreneurship. Now, we had the money to handle that at the time, but not every company will. And you could be preventing you know, companies from moving forward with some very exciting ideas that will then go overseas. So, you know, why do I bother you with this old chestnut beyond his excuse to show the picture of my son in his anti-ITAR onesie that a friend from Johnson got him uh, when he was born? Uh, unfortunately, export control reform themed uh, baby wear did not catch on, but... <laughs> so the reason I get concerned is Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which uh, you already heard from, from Skip, the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space can move another celestial body shall acquire authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. No two words in the English language are more nervous than continuing supervision by the government. Because you just don't know how that is going to turn out. Again, as was described, this is a treaty of principles, and it's up to each nation to interpret domestically <coughs> and move forward with how they're going to proceed. And certainly under ITAR, uh, we saw that that continuing supervision was not implemented, at least the first, uh, in a sensible, rational fashion, certainly not one that was supportive of commercial space or entrepreneurialism. So you've got some potential danger here for commercial space activity in a requirement of the Outer Space Treaty, one, by the way, that makes sense. You know, it's not the principle itself, but we have to pay attention to how this is implemented, because in the wrong hands, you know, things could go very poorly. <coughs> so at the Comstock, uh, we actually moved forward on this, I think it's almost been two years now, where we recommended a mission licensing approach. And the idea was to have a limitation on this continuing supervision where you would look at national security issues, you would look at international treaty obligations, as well as harmful interference with either domestic or foreign activities. And if you, know, you met those, you could get a mission license from the FAA, Office of Commercial Space Transportation. There was some nomenclature changes where we then started calling it mission authorization uh, after that. So that was a couple of years ago. More recently, uh, as of last year, Congressman Jim Bridenstine, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, introduced what's called enhanced payload reviews. And here the concept to address Article 6 was to leverage the existing payload review process at the FAA ASD and really simply add a number of additional questions to that procedure that would look at the actual operation uh, of your activity. Um, well, Comstack hasn't had a chance you know, to rule on that per se, just personally, uh, it's a concept that I like a lot because you're not creating more bureaucracy, you're not creating anything new, you're leveraging an existing process that I think reduces risk of something new, avoids double dipping, which we always want to do in a regulatory sense, and was kind of a known entity that wouldn't take a huge push to move forward with. And by the way, this is the status quo. That right now, you know, the issue with Article 6 is that we have no process for certain innovative activities. Satellite service being an example. Asteroid mining, another private sector space stations. That pretty much what you have to do now on a de facto basis is go solicit a uh, payload review from the FAAST. The House, uh, as was mentioned, and Skip and I were talking about a baseball game, uh, has introduced some draft legislation, and I would put this more along the lines of a deemed approved swim lane, presumed approved authorities. It's somewhat difficult to describe, um, but the idea is very much a presumption of approval, and it shifts from an interagency process to providing exclusive authority to the Department of Commerce which I appreciate what is trying to be done, but I think that could be problematic in a number of ways and, and have some concerns. But what I'm most worried about is no action, because the status quo right now is a complete lack of certainty, predictability, there's no deadlines, there's no transparency, and it really empowers the bureaucracy to do whatever they want, because there's no rules to the game, essentially. And what we need is a process, and this is you know, what Comstack, when we passed uh, observations, findings, and recommendations about mission licensing, this is what we were trying to do, was just establish a procedure, some rules to the game, because if you're an investor, or you're an insurer in any of these innovative activities, you want to know what the process is, much less no one wants their launch suspended or canceled, because at the last minute, Department of Defense or the intelligence community found a concern that we need a framework to work within 
And we don't have that right now. We're just operating again on an ad hoc basis every time with the payload review process. And it's only been done twice so far, once by Bigelow Aerospace uh, and once by Moon Express. And a lot of what we've done in this ad hoc process can't be done on a regular basis, so we've got concerns about where we're going to head with this in the future. And I'm very excited, and let me compliment everyone at Capitol Hill for tackling this issue, because again, we're all space attorneys, we'll show up and discuss this at 7.30 in the morning. Let me assure you, you know, it's not over healthcare in Iraq on Capitol Hill, but the fact that both the House and the Senate uh, are taking a look at this, Senator Cruz in particular is holding a series of hearings, uh, Senator Markey is ranking member, is very supportive of this, it's great that we're going to try and get some action on this particular issue uh, on Capitol Hill. Just a couple of other uh, pieces of legislation I'd like to bring uh, to everyone's attention. In 2015, we passed the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Uh, I won't go through everything in that slide, but that also looked at a number of other regulatory issues that are of concern uh, in industry, Article 6 you know, being just one of them, but there's a lot of different questions we've got about space traffic management, how we're going to handle that in the U.S., and you know, what entity within the federal government uh, will be responsible, what's going to happen to the International Space Station uh, post-2024. And what the CSLCA did was ask for a series of reports from the White House and Office of Science and Technology Policy is kind of where we're headed on this. And now what you're seeing on Capitol Hill is reactions to these reports, and we're trying to take action. Um, another piece of legislation, going back to Congressman Bridenstine that we saw last year, was the American Space Renaissance Act. And what I loved about what Jim Bridenstine did with this bill is we love stovepipes in the aerospace arena, right? You've got your national security space over here, your commercial space, your science. That's just not the way the real world works. That all of these different aspects of space interact together. And if we really want any of them to succeed, we should adopt a holistic approach. And that's what Congressman Bridenstine did with that legislation, is looked at space as a whole. And unfortunately, the congressional process you know, pushes us into our state uh, stovepipe. So we've got you know, the commercial space bill. We've got the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act. Um, we don't look at everything as a whole. And that's what I like so much about the American Space Renaissance Act. Um, getting back to the space traffic cop issue, you know, here you see what things look like in orbit. And right now, we are dependent upon the Department of Defense and the JSPOC for basically being the commercial traffic cop for all of the private sector space. Uh, if I can steal a story from Congressman Bridenstine that he likes to tell, uh, we're all familiar with the Chinese ASAP test that occurred in 2007. Well, we have the Department of Defense and the JSPOC <coughs> warning China that their debris from their ASAP test is going to hit their space station. I don't think that's the job of the DOD to do. They should be focused on the war fight. And I think there's a great deal of frustration at the Department of Defense that they have had to take on this responsibility. They're not getting paid to do it, et cetera. And at the very least, I think one would imagine, we've had discussions of this at least at the Comstock, although I don't think any clear decisions yet, that a civil agency should be responsible for at least informing the private sector of potential conjunctions, that we need to take this burden off of DOD so, again, they can focus on their primary mission with the war fighters. So this is an issue that I think you're going to hear uh, a lot about. And then you've got small sats and cube sats. And, you know, this is going to be a whole new issue as we go from hundreds to thousands of cube sats and small sats being deployed. Uh, again, another topic that the Comstack has been trying to take on that we talked a lot about uh, at UN COPUS. Uh, here I'd like to steal a little bit from uh, Doug Levero, former Department of Defense official, uh, who says that the first time that a $10,000 CubeSat smashes into a $400 million <laughs> satellite, guess what? Then we're going to see some regulations. And this is what happened with ITAR, by the way, that you never make good regulations in a crisis or emergency scenario. And I think it's incumbent upon us as attorneys, as policymakers, and folks who can influence this process to try and come up with good regulations, good policies, and get them in place now so that when an accident does occur, and it will occur, that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction that creates policies that are going to hurt entrepreneurialism and hurt the industry for decades to come. So, you know, if I can leave you with anything, it's take action now 
to put in place good ideas and good policies because if we have a knee-jerk situation related to a crisis, you know, we're just going to repeat history as we did uh, with the ITAR. Um, I also want to make a quick mention of DARPA's uh, CONFERS effort. Again, we talked about satellite servicing. and you know, This is a number of ways that we need to provide some rules of the road. And DARPA is going to hire a, a secretariat. Um, you know, my hope is it might even be Secure World Foundation uh, before this is all said and done, where you would look at what the rules of the road and, and what the uh, common uh, interface point should be for satellite servicing missions. And DARPA doesn't want to be responsible for that. They want an NGO like Secure World uh, to be able to take that on to eventually fund it themselves. But it's terrific that DARPA is looking at this kind of regulatory uh, issue to make sure that all of our systems in space are interoperable, uh, both foreign and domestic. So I'm excited to see that move forward. Uh, we've heard a, a lot about COPUS. Um, you know, I think that there have been some gross misinterpretations at the COPUS meeting that we were at relative to what the U.S. has done, particularly relative to the CSLCA, the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Um, there were those at the meeting that were talking about the CSLCA was an example of the U.S. legislating for the world. And I, I found that particularly appalling because what we were really trying to do with the CSLCA, and the private sector was very engaged on this, was trying to meet our own obligations under the Outer Space Treaty. And I would argue that the U.S. is in greater compliance with the Outer Space Treaty after the passage of the CSLCA than we were before. And find me a, another piece of legislation where you see the words international treaty obligations come up as often as it did within the CSLCA. That's unique. And we were making a real effort, uh, I think, as an industry, as a community on Capitol Hill, to address the Outer Space Treaty and make sure that we were conforming. Uh, and it was very unfortunate, I think, some of the interpretations uh, that were put forward at the COPUS, and that's something I know that Secure World and myself and others tried to uh, set straight. So uh, just talking about the future a little bit here, what can we expect? Uh, Congressman Bridenstine is developing a second sequel uh, to the American Space Renaissance Act. Unlike most movie sequels, I expect this one to be even better than the original. So I'm excited about where this is going ahead. Uh, we are working on a second Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Again, Senator Cruz is already actively holding a series of hearings on this issue. Uh, and again, I really have to compliment Senator Cruz and his staff for focusing on this. You know, this is really important, but it doesn't grab the headlines, at least nationally. Uh, so the fact that we're moving forward aggressively to support commercial space, to support entrepreneurialism uh, on Capitol Hill, I think is terrific. And we'll also see a new NASA reauthorization bill. And in that bill, you can expect to see, I think, a lot about public-private partnerships. Because I think you can't leave out the critical role of NASA and the U.S. government in terms of entrepreneurship. That we need the government as a catalyst. We need them as a customer. And that's how we've gotten a lot of the new space capabilities uh, that everyone's so excited about. So government has a strong role to play. And I'm excited about the positives that I think we'll see in a future NASA reauthorization bill. As we mentioned with Article 6, uh, there are efforts to address this. Uh, I think you know we've got a long way to go, but it's terrific that we are having explicit discussions uh, at this point. Uh, we talked a little bit about an entity that uh, is in civil space like AST uh, beginning to address some of the responsibilities that DOD has for commercial conjunctions, uh, and again, uh, a lot of uh, public-private partnerships. And you know, in terms of the conversations that we've had at the Comstack, again, they're just some core principles that the private sector wants to see. Predictability in our regulations. We need to know what's going to happen. We don't want to have to play a guessing game. Investors, insurers, they don't want to see that. Transparency. Let us see, for example, if an application is denied, tell us why. And if it's classified and we have people who can support that, let's have a classified conversation. So I think that transparency is key for the private sector and the government to work together moving mm -hmm. forward. Uh, responsiveness, you know, we can't have uh, licenses or applications go on and on for years. And again, I think the government has been trying to improve this process both in remote sensing, uh, in launch licenses, et cetera, but you know, we can continue to work uh, in terms of efficiency to move that period forward. So uh, of course, while here to talk about the Outer Space Treaty, I don't think, have we mentioned yet, but this is the 50th anniversary of the Outer Space Treaty this year. Um, I'm not going to sing happy birthday because I don't want to empty out the room before Marcia Angelo talks. Uh, but, you know, per, you know, the excellent comments that Mike and Skip made 
with the treaty. I, I love what you said, that it's a treaty of principles, right? That the Outer Space Treaty isn't prescriptive. It doesn't tell every country exactly how you need to get to those principles. But it laid out some general principles that are critical, absolutely critical, for holding the rest of the world and keeping them honest. And that's why I believe that the Outer Space Treaty is something that we should be rallying around because it benefits America, it benefits entrepreneurs in many, many ways. Getting back to the COPUA sessions, one of my concerns is directions that people were going outside the Outer Space Treaty. And we talked a lot about you know, the asteroids and uh, extraterrestrial resource utilization, what's happening there. And there was a lot of discussion uh, about additional working groups and possible guidelines and other different treaty applications that are not necessary. That as we discussed, the Outer Space Treaty lays out the principles and it does a good job doing that. And then it's up to the states to implement those principles. And one of the great things is, as was mentioned, you know, there are a number of countries that are even leaning more forward than the US, Luxembourg, and UAE has done an excellent job uh, with their space policy in terms of addressing Article 6 uh, and creating this you know, common sense environment. So we can actually learn from what some of these other countries are doing as we you know, continue to tweak and develop uh, our own national space law. But the idea should be to rally around the treaty. It does a good job. What we need to do is prevent other less sensible, more bureaucratic ideas from propping up that would hurt innovation, that would hurt development. So. Let me just end by saying, happy birthday, Outer Space Treaty. You don't look a day over 30. <laughs>
uh, we're based here in Colorado, as was, as was said, and, and even probably some of you know our business, some of you may not, but we've been now on over 430 space missions. Uh, so it's a pretty long history of what we did. Uh, 4,000 things we've built to go to space, and uh, last year we launched something every three weeks, uh, and that's uh, about 20 launches of something we built this year. So it's a lot of activity, a lot of hardware, which means that we run into all the issues regarding the space treaty all the time. We, we do this globally. We have 30 partners around the world. We've done 70 missions for NASA, and we've got right now business in 20 countries or so. Uh, the four things that we do, and, and I think is, is fairly common for this part of the space treaty, we're a builder of satellites, we're a builder of technologies that go other places, other worlds, we're builders of motors and environmental systems, and as was mentioned, we're the builders of the next generation space shuttle, which is being built here in Colorado. Uh, Colorado has really quite changed in, in the history that I've been doing this. We went from not even being known in the space industry now by most standards being in the one, two, or three slot. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to see. Uh, what's also pretty amazing when I step back, we had our 25th anniversary <coughs> last year, and I realize a kid from nowhere is running a company that has now visited seven planets, uh, a comet, an asteroid, the sun, the moon, and we've been to Mars now more times than any other company in the world. And the point of that is it's a really proud thing to do, and my team goes home and says, hey, we landed on Mars today. You think that's a cool thing to bring to a, a grammar school when they have uh, bring mommy or daddy to, to school day? Well, what did you do today? Well, we landed on Mars. It's a pretty good thing. But the point of this is not only are we very proud of it, but we are really reaching the, as the whole aspects of that whole space treaty concept. We're doing it every week, every time we launch, every time we work. This isn't a theory. This isn't something that's on a piece of paper. This is real life every day. Uh, and the real life goes on and on. This is a picture for some of you may have seen, but this is from the uh, New Horizons mission to Pluto. What's particularly interesting about this is it was built and launched in 2004. And as some of you know, it got to Pluto last year. And that's a long way to go. The people who were brought onto this program to run this were intentionally hired on the younger end of the scale because the program is going to go on for 20 years. <laughs> and in our world, we have to think long term like that. It isn't something that turns over in two or three or four months. And this mission is still going. It's going to have another fly by Pluto in a, in a couple of years. But it's providing data and doing a lot of things. One of the things that I like to say, this is a, an image of, uh, it's interesting. The one in the back doesn't change. <laughs> uh, anyway, we have stereo. It's a long way away from Pluto to here. <laughs> But I happen to be the unofficial head of the Let's Make Pluto a Planet Society. <laughs> As we talk about celestial bodies, uh, it's really quite interesting. When we launched this, this mission, Pluto was a planet, and every one of us in this room wound up learning in school that Pluto was a planet, I think. I don't think there's anyone in this, in this room that did not. Somewhere about four years into the mission, we had to call this little spacecraft. It, the, it, it becomes, we, we get very personal about our spaceships. They, they, they start getting a personality and you start talking to them. This one went to sleep for about three months and you woke it up because it needed its power. Well, one time we woke it up to say hello and you wait for the beeps to come in. And we had to tell it that it was no longer a planetary mission. <laughs> and the little spacecraft started crying. You could hear them all the way past Saturn. It was, it was terrible. Uh, but personally, I think if it, something looks like this and has the interesting things going on, it is a planet. But the point of this is that the, the treaty is a real thing. It has celestial bodies that we need to deal with all the time. This is a, a very interesting looking spacecraft called Cassini. It's in the news quite rapidly these days. Uh, you can't really see it in this picture, but Cassini was built by over 10 different countries. And it was, it, it was a cooperative effort from around the world. And its job was to go look for Saturn. Well, this is one of the interesting pictures that came up from Cassini. It's going to uh, uh, do a suicidal run into Saturn here very shortly. And the reason it is, does anyone know why we're going to kill the spacecraft? You don't count. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to risk contamination with like There you go. We're going to kill the spacecraft because we're thinking that if for some reason it lands on one of the moons, we, some part of that spacecraft, has biological material from humans on it. And if that biological material got into water, we could be starting a whole other 
race of things. And someday, 100 years from now, uh, somebody's going to land there and say, look, we found life. And it's really going to be a piece of somebody from Pasadena, California. <laughs> so the way to make sure that doesn't happen is we're going to run it in through the atmosphere and into the planet, and it's going to die. But one of the things it did, it took a picture here, which I'm showing you, fascinating picture of one of the moons. You can't really see it, but there's some blue outlined activities. <clears throat> Underneath this moon is oceans, oceans of water that we believe probably has life in it of some type, at least I do. And so when we're talking about the Outer Space Treaty, we're not talking in theory anymore. We're going and seeing places that are going to really expand our thought process about what we really are doing in space. Uh, one of the things we're very fortunate in doing is we are building the plant growth experiments on the space station, how to grow food in space, which was probably a pretty good thing if we're going to go long distance, we're going to want to have food. Not just to eat, actually, psychologically, it's a really important thing. So we got a, a group of many of the top botanists in the world, most people that really know a lot about this. I know very little, even though I was raised on a farm. We started with lettuce, which is what you see here, and, and it worked really well. Then they said, well, let's start doing what the best foods would be for long distance journeys. And I put my hand up and I said chocolate, but that didn't actually go over really well. Anyone know what the next vegetable chosen by top of the 40 of the top botanists in the world was? No. So far in six months of doing this talk, or this, this kind of talk, no one had gotten it yet. It's bok choy. And the, for a variety of reasons, it has many purposes, it can store well, it's got nutrition. The next one after that is peppers uh, that we're doing, our Chinese cabbage and peppers. The reason for peppers is when you go to space, when you go through space training, you, one of the first things you do is you lose your sense of taste in space. And the astronauts who are on the space station, they're in, invariably what they ask for is hot sauce. And they keep asking for hotter and hotter sauce the longer they're up there because the, you, you wind up, because we taste actually through our smell, you wind up losing your sense of taste. So we're actually going to grow peppers. And one of the, the quiet inside jokes you, you find out is that when the astronauts come back after six or two, eight months on the station, we give them the same pepper sauce that they had on the space station. They can't touch it. It's so hot. It's, it comes from this special place in Thailand that you don't really want to go anywhere near, trust me. <laughs> but why are we doing that? Well, we're learning how to grow food in space for the purposes of bringing that technology home. So space, when we go to the space treaty, it's not just what we do up in space, it's what we bring back home. What are we doing in space? We're learning how to grow food with limited water and a lot of sunlight or no sunlight. That qualifies about a third of the world that needs food. So part of my job is to figure out how to take this technology and bring it back home. This is uh, one of my favorite little guys. It's uh, two, two spaceships we sent to Mars, Spirit and Curiosity. Uh, we were, it was a six-month mission that we were supposed to go on, basically. And one of them now is they are now well over 10 years working on Mars and, and doing what it needs to do. And this whole thing is, is, was a quite fascinating thing for us to work on. For those of you who are geeks in space, we actually put that spacecraft in this thing. And one of the best, one of the best kind of presentations I think I've ever been part of is the presentation where we stood in front of a room of people like this, 40 or 50 really smartest people in the world, and so we're going to take your spacecraft, your billion dollar spacecraft, we're going to put it in this really big beach ball. <laughs> we're going to take this beach ball and we're going to throw it out a spacecraft. It's going to hit Mars. It's going to bounce, I don't know, maybe 5, 10, 50 times. We're not exactly sure. And then like a weeble, it's going to land in the right position, upright, in a really good place, and we're going to deflate the beach ball and the, and the rover is going to roll off. Yeah, they all looked at us just like that. <laughs> and they said, no, well, that's not... Well, the idea here is that sometimes when something is really crazy, nothing else works, it's the crazy idea that winds up happening. And that moves forward. And it's been going on for quite a long time. <coughs> this guy's uh, curiosity, it landed um, now four years ago. Those of you who might have watched it, it was, uh, it was one of the most co coolest things I've been involved with. All the museums around the world all kicked in at the same time. We were fortunate to do the descent system the last, the last part of the mission. It's called the seven minutes of terror, for those of you who may remember. I had the last minute of the seven minutes of terror. And it, it really didn't dawn on us until we got out there to Pasadena and we're all sitting around and somebody came in and said, good news, we're going to have photographic evidence of the entire landing. And we said, well, that's really good. And then we realized, 
Well, that means which one of us fails is going to be on that global TV. And I realized I didn't have enough Valium at that point. <laughs> but the point of that is that we came in and we did, it did work. One of the things most people don't realize, though, is that if you look at this closely, there are no solar panels on this guy. It's actually a derivative of nuclear power. Space treaty implications, we launched a, a pre-stage version of a nuclear reactor from Florida. Nobody thinks of it in those terms, but that's what it is. And it is now working on Mars, and it's been working there for quite a bit of long time. This is uh, the first high-definition picture from the surface of Mars. Pretty cool thing to be part of. All of a sudden, you're seeing Mars like you're seeing your outdoors. And this is the drill bit that was put together. Very interesting drill bit. Used uh, uh, resources like the Colorado School of Mines, geologists on our team. It's not just space scientists and rocket scientists and technologists like me. It's a whole bunch of people, botanists and, and geologists. Uh, our governor, who was a former geologist, could have been involved in this project at one point in his career. The whole thing about this, though, is that we're drilling it to the surface of Mars to look for stuff. What we're also doing is taking technology and figuring out how to make it work on Earth. One of the most interesting things is that some of this is going into the next gener generation of prosthetics. Uh, soldiers and sailors and Marines who are coming in needing arms and legs. The big deal in the medical world is called neuroprosthetics, thinking it and making it move. And we're learning how to do that in space and bringing it back home. This is uh, my favorite of my three generations of Mars. You can see the growth of the government programs over a period of time. <laughs> From this little guy to where we are now, this is the size of a, a basically of a Mini Cooper of a car, about 1,600 pounds, and we're sending that off to Mars. Uh, the next generation is now in uh, development. We're part of that. It's called Mars 2020. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to launch, as you can guess, in Mars and to Mars in 2020. Uh, but what's particularly interesting about this is it's going to be the first time that we're, we're thinking that we're going to be able to take a sample of Mars and bring it back home. Again, the space treaty issue. We're going to have, is that a celestial body? What does it mean? What, is, what does that mean for the future? Uh, Juno is a, is a spacecraft going to Jupiter. One of the things that we're involved with is how to protect this spacecraft from radiation. Radiation is a, is a major deal. In Colorado, we get a rad, a rad of radiation is the measurement. We get about 1.4 uh, radiations because we're closer to the sun here, 0.4 of 1. When we go to Jupiter, it's 20 million rads of radiation. And this spacecraft goes at 165,000 miles an hour at the peak speed, which is Mach 250. And Greg, I know you, you fly your plane fast, but probably not heard that fast. <laughs> the space shuttle, by comparison, flew Mach 25. So this goes 10 times the speed of the space shuttle. And the whole point of this is how you protect it, and that's part of our job. Well, that radiation protection comes back in and says, can we make it in the next generation medical x-rays so that you could take 1,000 x-rays and not get hurt? Wouldn't that be a good thing if we could do that? Uh, one of the things that we're working on, we got the contract to build a prototype, ground prototype of the next spaceship, a space station called the Space Gateway. That's going to be built here in Colorado. So in Colorado, we will have both the space shuttle and the, one of the versions of the next commercial space station. And I'll get to that in a second. We started the satellite industry in 2003. That's really the beginnings of the small satellite industry as we know it today. And this was our satellite called Chipsat, one of my favorite little guys. The, the reason that was special is the first satellite you could control from the internet. I could control it from my laptop. And now we are having thousands of satellites being produced. The rate of change, some of you know Moore's law about the rate of change of technology, does not apply here. Moore's, Moore's law is too slow. The number of space, uh, space objects that are going to be here by the end of the decade is going to be 24 times as many as there were at the beginning of the decade. This is what we're doing now over in Louisville. We have an assembly facility to build satellites on an assembly line for the first time in history. We're also building this guy. It's called Dream Chaser. It's the next generation space shuttle. And I put this picture up because I like little brother and big brother here. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. It is to scale. But what's quite interesting for us is that our vehicle has as much usable room in it as the space shuttle did. The space shuttle was really a big cargo truck. And I say it was like if I was moving from New York to Colorado, I'd use a moving van. And there'd be a cab up front and a big trailer in the back. When I got here, I wouldn't want to be driving that moving van around town, so I'd want a good SUV. 
we're the good SUV for space, the space utility vehicle, as we like to call it. And we're very fortunate to have a, a long-term NASA contract, as was mentioned. This is a fun picture just taken uh, just a few weeks ago in California where we're doing flight tests. Uh, NASA opened up the historic hangar where the shuttle exists right now. Uh, and it was a museum, basically. Uh, not as good as Wings Over the Rockies, but it was a museum. And uh, we, we were able to now sit inside, and, and we've got our vehicle being developed in the same place that the shuttle was, which is, to me, it's a historical thing. We like the fact that we, we're passing on that torch from one generation to another. But the space treaty done 50 years ago is as relevant to us today as it was when it was written. One big difference, 50 years ago, there were only about six countries that had a space program. And they did not imagine, although they should have, that there'd be a commercial space industry. Uh, we flew, before we went to California, we actually flew the vehicle around Colorado. And as a company, as a person who's both a pilot, runs a company, a technologist, we had a long list of all the things we needed to do to go do a ceremonial flight around Colorado. We wanted to show it off to our friends and family and thank everybody. We actually flew it over uh, Scott Carpenter's uh, home and park in, in uh, Boulder. Scott was an advisor and a friend and one of the first astronauts. We did everything right except one thing. We notified the, the Air, AV, uh, FAA. <laughs> we did everything right. Except on the morning we did this, there were over 400 calls into the police departments for the UFO that was flying. <laughs> Didn't anticipate that one, although I probably should have. It was a lot of fun, and we, we did enjoy making it a work around here. Uh, so this is what it looks like today in its second generation. But what we're doing with this kind of vehicle is really the things that the Outer Space Treaty is, is really addressing. It's five different variants off the same vehicle. We're flying crew and cargo to the space station and other places. We're doing exploration with it. We're doing a science laboratory with it. And we're going out to fix things in space, all from the same basic vehicle. And one of the th cool things about it is it can land in any airport, uh, anywhere that a uh, Southwest can land, I like to say. Uh, anywhere that a, a uh, 737 can land, we can land. Because we took out all the hazardous materials. We're actually the first green spaceship that's in, that's in the, uh, the fleet that uh, has operated which means we could come back and land in DIA. This creates an awful lot of different kind of opportunities for what we might do with the vehicle as we go forward. And one of the things that we're looking at, and I'd like to take a moment and talk about what commercial <coughs> space is. You hear a lot of the words. Sometimes it makes me laugh. I was one of the founders of what's now called the Commercial Space Flight Federation. That is uh, about 14 years old, 13 years old. And at the time, we had the first board meeting of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, so we did it in a Denny's around the table in California. True story. There were about seven of us. Uh, Elon Musk was one of the founders, and there's uh, a group of us. That now group numbers over 80 since that period of time. And the difference, what makes it different, there have been commercial space companies since there's been space. Lockheed, Boeing, all the companies in the history of space. The difference, and the really big difference when it comes to the space treaty, so we own the spaceships. It's, an, it's a property, intellectual property rights for the attorneys in the room. It's a, we own the asset. The government is buying a service from us. And that changes the game completely. We own everything we build. The satellites, the space stations, the rockets, the spaceship is a property of my company, which changes the world of how you see things. When the space treaty was first put together, they did not imagine that a company like ours or a guy like me from, from nowhere could be in a place where we would be owning space assets. And that's why we need to look at how this goes forward. We are now doing this on a global basis. Basically, we're providing a turnkey space program to a country. We can provide a spaceship, a rocket, training, the astronauts if they need to, and put it all together so that a country that doesn't have a space program can buy a space program. Basically, it's a timeshare. And that's a concept that I'm sure was not thought about in 1967. But it's real, and it's working quite well. And we're doing that working with agencies all over the place. One of the things that was brought up is that we had this crazy idea that maybe we could do things. The, the treaty calls for the peaceful use of outer space. The problem is that most of the world can't get to outer space. So we said, what could we do about that? Well, we came up with this crazy idea of maybe doing a mission for the United Nations. United Nations has a space agency. There are 84 countries that are part of it, including the United States. It's never done a mission since it started now almost 50 years ago as well. So we said, let's think about this. 
we have a spaceship, we have the ability to do a mission, so why don't we do a mission? And why don't we do it in a way that could actually benefit the world? And at the same time, bring attention to the fact that the space is changing. So we came up with this idea that on our spaceship, we could carry about 25 experiments. And we said, suppose we take 25 countries who've never been to space on board, underneath the, uh, the mantle of the United Nations, let them have their first mission. We can paint the spaceship blue. We can put their, uh, seriously, we can put their flag on it, and we can land it in any country in the world that we want to. This is an operational issue. There is, of course, the legal issues and the governmental issues and all those other things. But for the most part, the US government has said, well, you're not selling the vehicle. It's like an airplane. Frankly, the Boeing 787 has more technology in it than my space plane does. And that's going everywhere in the world. So this idea, which was pretty, pretty far-fetched, we thought was going to take four or five years to get through the UN, took seven months. Because they realized what a way to highlight the peaceful use of outer space. And in June of last year, we, we announced an agreement to do this mission. And the mission is now sl slated for 2021. Uh, and if you look at the, outer, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, raise awareness of space exploration, foster dialogue with the space industry, promote cooperation between nations, all the good things that the UN is supposed to do, they just didn't have a way to do it. So we found a way to do it by creating a specialized mission. And what we're, what we're doing with this mission is essentially taking our vehicle and turning it into a laboratory. And the UN's job is to figure out which 25 countries are going to fly on board uh, when we go fly. Our job is to make it work and to bring it home and to land it. And what was really fun and, and probably the most gratifying, this is what one quarter of one side of the vehicle looks like. All different kinds of experiments can go inside. And I'll end with Walt Disney in a minute. That's just a tease. <laughs> Walt would be really happy by my doing that. So what was the really cool part about it? Well, we launched this and, and we announced it, and uh, about three months ago, we did a first gathering of countries that might be interested in going. Forty-five countries showed up who, who want to possibly be on this mission. And they were countries, and I've been doing this, uh, being in aviation all my life, they are countries I never knew even had a space program. Uh, we got a visitor from Mongolia. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Mongolia. I haven't. <laughs> But I, I didn't, and I've been to 60 countries, I've never been to Mongolia. I didn't imagine that they had a space program. So what was also fascinating is more than half of these countries were represented by women leadership. And they came to this meeting in their national costume. I can imagine this woman coming from some very remote place in Mongolia, showing up in Dubai, which is where the meeting was, getting off the plane and seeing Dubai. I, I don't know what that was like. It's probably like going to outer space or something. But uh, what's fascinating, because what they said was that we never thought we would have a chance to go to space. And the whole point of this was, as a kid growing up, I said, wouldn't it be amazing if I could someday go to space or make something happen? And as I traveled the world, I realized there's so many smart young people in the world that deserve that same opportunity. And this was what was motivating this particular program. Sure, it's commercial. Sure, it's a business. But sometimes in a business, you can pause and say, let's do something that's really interesting and good without necessarily being something for profit. This woman showed up and said, you don't know how big a hero you are for doing something like this. And I said, I, I'm sorry. I've never traveled to Mongolia. And she said, but you understand that you were this company nobody knew of, and now you're doing something like this. This gives us hope. That paled in comparison to the next conversation I had, which was a woman from the South Sudan. I don't know how many of you are geopolitical, but the South Sudan is one of our newest, if not the newest country in the world. It is a mess of a country. And it's likely to be in the middle of a huge problem. So I'm asking, it was another woman who came up, and I said, I'm sorry, I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful here, but why on earth is the South Sudan interested in something in space? It doesn't make sense to me. She looked at me very calmly, very calm and directly, and she said, we're going to have a genocide in our country in the next five years, and we want to record it. Right. So that's when we realized the power of what space can do. And treaties aside and all the things that we can do, this is real life. These are real people. These are real things going on every day. And, and I end with Walt Disney because Walt, uh, for some of you don't know, and I, I like ending on a fun, upbeat note, Walt was the first spokesperson for NASA. 
NASA was smart enough to realize that partnerships are a good thing, and they went out and they found Walt Disney, and he got all sorts of interested in the space program and helped them get off the ground. That's why the whole Mercury 7 came about and a lot of the history came about with early NASA programs. But it also affected him pretty well. How many of you have ever been to a Disney park? <laughs> in the Disney charter, a quarter of the business of Disney and the parks have to be focused on tomorrow. That's why we have Tomorrowland. That's why we have Space Mountain. That's why we have Mission to Space. He thought that back even in the 60s and the 50s, that that was what would be important for the next generation of young people, to see the future. And he was going to help that happen, both for NASA as well as for, for the world. I was fortunate enough to see the back end of that, and you start thinking about life is art and art is life. Uh, we helped sponsor the Star Wars launch last year. We were part of the whole Star Wars activity. And never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be helping to launch a Star Wars program in California. What you see here is the first ever marathon in Disneyland. And I, you all are calm by, as an audience. The audience I spoke to out there were many thousands of people broken into three categories. Those who were Disney characters, princesses and dressed up. Second group of people who were professional runners. Apparently it's, if you're a marathoner, doing a first ever marathon is like flying a first ever airplane. But they came from all over the world, so they're all running in place with their camelbacks and moving around while we were speaking. And the third were Star Wars dressed characters. <laughs> Can you imagine talking to this audience? <laughs> in the middle of the, of the talk, a, a march of Wookiees walked by. <laughs> and they just looked at me very calmly, and then we moved on. <laughs> and it was a, it, it's a fascinating experience. But the whole point of that story, besides it being fun, is that we, we do or we are not only thinking about space, but we're thinking about the future of our kids and how we move forward. This is a pretty famous picture. Uh, some of you may or may not know it, but at the time the Outer Space Treaty was being put together, there was a movie that was being put together that affected me and was one of the things that got me started going in space. It's called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Have any of you, any of you seen it? Some of you have seen it? Most of you have seen it. Uh, what was really cool about that, I got the chance to meet the writer behind that. His name is Arthur Clarke. Arthur was one of the most fascinating people in the world. He wrote that in 1948, a book called The Sentinel. He imagined the world of space, travel, communication, all the things, before there was a space program. And he imagined what that was going to look like. And, he's, and, he, and he used music from Strauss, which is the famous song that's in the movie, from, from the 1800s. Wrote the book in 1948. Movie came out in 67 and 68 at the same time the treaty did. And it affected a lot of people, including me, as I saw it later on as a teenager. And uh, I don't know if I can show this, but in closing, if. Uh, Wonderful music. We all want to dance as we're finishing the talk before the questions and answer. Why did I show this? What you see here is a space station. In the movie, it was a commercial space station. What you see going up here is a commercial space plane. And for the 1960s, pretty good graphics and, frankly, pretty good design. And that's the deck of Dream Chaser from the 1960s. And I saw this and I said, wouldn't it be great to be able to someday think about doing something like this? And it looks, you know, it looks like a bit of a cartoon, but 50 years ago, it wasn't a bad view of life, right? Does anyone know who operated that space that spaceship? Pan Am. Anybody remember Pan Am? <laughs> Pan Am at the time was the most valuable brand in the world, more valuable than Coca-Cola. And it apparently is no longer there, although people have been trying to resurrect it from time to time. But from that period of time, we had two things. The most valuable company in the world is gone. And this idea of commercial space is not just a movie anymore. Here's a kid from nowhere running a company in Colorado. We're building a space station and a spaceship going up. That movie has come to life. And not just for me, but for a lot of people. So when you talk about the space treaty, it's not an abstract. We're doing this for real life. And in, my, in, in an ending, dreams don't have an expiration date in my world. These are things that keep going on and on and on. And that's, the space treaty is something that will need to be not just thought about, 
by smart people like we have here, but put into practice. Put into practice every day, and this is something we face. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks. Lesson number one, business people who are actually doing things in space and have really cool slides to show are much more entertaining than lawyers. <laughs> but uh, let's bring the speakers up and uh, we have a good half hour or more for discussion. So uh, we'll go till 10 o'clock and if people need to leave, feel free to leave at 10. But let's, let's see kind of where we are then. Uh, and we'll leave the, the, the dream up. So let's see. No. That mic? Is that the only thing you guys still have your mics? Okay. So, who wants to have the first question? Chris. Hey, good morning. So, Chris Johnson from the Secure World Foundation. My question, well, first, thanks to the panelists. Informative, interesting. It's for, uh, it's always, uh, educational and interesting for me to hear people talk about Article 6, the requirements from Article 6, uh, and they, to understand better, uh, Michael, your, your views and understandings of Article 6. When we look at all the things we want to do in space uh, in the near term, long term, do we need to amend the Outer Space Treaty? Do we need to modify it? And if no, then, uh, then what's our course of action as a state, as a, as a nation? to you know, come up with interpretations or understandings to do all the things that we want to do and still be in compliance with international space law. Okay, so, yeah, come so on. the question is, do we need to <clears throat> amend the Outer Space Treaty or modify it, or is it adequate for moving forward? I can't even get a warm-up question here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right away. So, I'm the gold standard. I'm the, I'm the fool's gold standard. <laughs> so it, again, an excellent question. Uh, and one that is being discussed in the halls of Congress right now. Um, and again, I'm just speaking for myself at this point. As I mentioned in the presentation, and as we heard, and again, go back to the point, the Outer Space Treaty is not prescriptive. It's not detailed. It doesn't say exactly how you get, have to get from here to there. It's principles. And I think that the principles that were articulated in the Outer Space Treaty are pretty eternal. Safety. You know, peaceful uses, uh, avoiding harmful interference. I don't think that I've seen principles that were laid down in the Outer Space Treaty that are necessarily problematic. As, as a matter of fact, I think they're very helpful and more relevant now than they've ever been. And my practical concern, and Mark makes an excellent point, this is not theory, this is not academic anymore. This has real world implications for ongoing activities here in the US. And when we talk about practicalities, to amend the Outer Space Treaty will require two thirds of the signatories, like right on that Secure World Foundation and other two thirds. And that's a pretty significant 51%. See, this is why I have to turn to the real lawyers. But <laughs> let's just say it's a pretty significant share of the members. And if you've been to a COPUA session, you know, you hear a lot, particularly from the developing companies, and Skip, you and I, and you know, unfortunately talking about this at a baseball game, because what happens when you take space lawyers, and you give them the beer, that's when it starts to come out. Um, it's always been a developed world versus a developing world debate, and that's what I think is so wonderful about what Mark has been doing with his company, that you're actually helping to heal that rift uh, and demonstrate that it doesn't have to be an antagonistic relationship. But my fear from a practical perspective is, if you had the votes to open up the Outer Space Treaty, I don't think that it would be in America's interest about what was going to march in through that door. So again, as I said, I would favor not opening up the treaty. I mean, in theory, if you were to give me a magic wand, I'm sure there are a number of issues that we might want to change, uh, some issues that could benefit from clarification. And I think we can do that via guidelines. I mean, long-term sustainability guidelines that were passed, I think, are a good example of how you can improve the treaty without opening it back up. And I'm much more comfortable in that kind of conversation, that kind of framework, than I would be actually opening the treaty up itself, because I don't think we would like what would walk in the door if we open it up. Yeah, and let me just tackle that. Is this 
yeah. um, uh, for a moment. There's one thing that the Outer Space Treaty does not provide for that you don't need to have in its text but could still be useful. And that would be an occasional gathering of the people who signed it and ratified it to talk about some of those clarifications. Um, I, I think there are just too many players right now that don't want to mess with the treaty. It's like holding a constitutional convention. You have no idea what would emerge at the end of it. Uh, but there are people who would like to at least begin some discussion of what some of the terms mean. There's just a number of those terms that we didn't think we had to define in, in 1967. Could be at least interesting to pe put people on record saying what they think they mean. And in effect, what I'm saying is that modern treaties, very recent treaties, tend to tend to include what's known as a committee of parties. Uh, there is no such committee of parties built into the Outer Space Treaty. I don't think I'd like a formal requirement, but gathering a few people, gathering the signatories to say, okay, let's talk about these issues, at least could give us some opinions of qualified publicists that would be useful in trying to maintain what is a cooperative spirit that really does drive the success of that treaty. And let me just add, from a political perspective on Capitol Hill, I think it's important that we not demonize those, the staffers or the members that are asking the question. Because I think it's a good question to ask. And I think it's excellent that we have this conversation. So I appreciate those members and staffers that are raising these issues and engaging in a constructive conversation on Capitol Hill. Yeah, let me add uh, two points. One is, uh, as you see the dates of these treaties that came out, they were really all relics of the Cold War. So back then you had the Soviets and their allies and us and our allies. And it was a lot easier to get things done. Uh, now we have, you know, lots, myriad of countries and companies that have active space programs and, and differing interests. And you still have a bit of the developing countries versus the developed countries but it's much more complicated than that now. So it would be very difficult to, to develop consensus at this point in time. Second point is that the law, in my opinion, should never lead the technology. Okay? Uh, so until we're doing things in space that need more regulation or more laws, we shouldn't create them. You know, it's, it's impediments to them. I think the best example of that is, look, the, 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 the most prevalent commercial use of outer space is communication satellites. Okay? Well, we've developed through the international telecommunication and every country has their administration that's part of the ITU, like we have the FCC. Okay? It's, it's a very detailed regulatory regime for use of the orbit spectrum resource. Okay? That followed the technology. Uh, and that's really the best way for it to develop. So uh, I'm not a fan of trying to, uh, whether it's amending the treaty or coming up with new treaties, that is going to um, provide impediments to the advancement of technology. All right, next question. Uh, yes? Here, why don't you speak into this since you're right here. Hi, I'm Sandy Pitzak, Tomorrow's Enterprise. Uh, Record. I am not a lawyer, I'm just a rocket scientist. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm trying to learn Nobody's about space law. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something that, that you mentioned, so uh, Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty says states shall avoid harmful contamination of space and celestial bodies. And I was wondering what the panel thinks that how this relates to the debris issue because uh, I know from a technical standpoint, having worked on, uh, on space debris, I'm thinking about these mega constellations of thousands of spacecraft, and certainly for the people that are uh, that uh, are customers and operators of these, they're valuable assets. But for everybody who's not, that's uh, just so much foreign object debris uh, that's potentially a hazard at that point. So I'm, I'm curious uh, to hear your interpretation of that. So. It you ask it again a really excellent question, and let me actually go back to something that Skip was saying that was so important. When we were at the COPUS legal subcommittee meetings together, and there was literally days, days spent on the asteroid mining issue, right? Days. And again, as Mark mentions, 2001, I mean, we're all science fiction fans. 
But I like keeping my science fiction in my personal life, not my policy life. And I thought it was, I don't want to say a complete waste, but certainly we could have been spending the time on more productive issues and more near-term issues, such as the one that you just raised. I mean, to me, that is one of the most important, most clear and present danger to the functioning, not only of future space, but to the operations that we have today. And there was a little bit of conversation at the COPUS of how we deal with that issue in relation to Article 9 and even just more generally what you do with small sats. And I think it's unfortunate that the asteroid mining issue has taken all the air out of the room for that because it's such a critical issue. So uh, in terms of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, again, I think the principle is there. So certainly there was a conversation that we could have about how we protect the space environment, how we avoid these aspects. I think actually, I'm loud enough you can hear me anyway. So, um, you might not get back. Back. Okay. So, <laughs> back on. Um, I, I think, again, it's incumbent upon the states underneath the treaty to implement the principles of the treaty. And when it comes to that small sat issue, I think there's actually an exciting opportunity for every country to come up with different ways to do that. You know, maybe one country requires transponders on all the satellites. Maybe, you know, another sets up a more aggressive registration regime. And I think it's great that we'll see how each country tries to handle that, and then we can all try and adopt the best practices from it. So from an operating perspective, I think it's a great question. Uh, let me ask a question. How many of you people recycle somewhere in your life? Recycling is less than 20 years old. And the reason I say that is that there are things that can be done. The, the idea of debris is one that's a very popular idea. So the, the practical part of debris is, is really falls into three categories. Things you can control, things you can't, and things you don't know about. The things you can control, what can we do? What could Copolis do? One of the things we can do is to make sure that any new satellites that go up have the capability of being deorbited, brought down. So from the ecological point of view, we couldn't clean up the whole world. We could stop it from getting worse. And in my mind, that is an, an addressable, easy, easy, the satellites we put up, we try to make sure they have, basically without getting into the science, you, you probably know it well, but you keep 5% of your fuel, you don't use it, so you can turn around the satellite and force it to come home. Come home quickly, quickly being months or years. The half-life for things that break up in space can be 50, 100, 200 years. So when they break up, they create a lot of mess. So the idea is to stop the mess from getting bigger. That is an addressable, real-term, short-term issue and is one that we could do. We put, uh, we we're all driving unleaded cars. That was not something that was there when the space treaty was put together. And we're doing that because we want to protect the environment. So doing things that are doable, reachable, practical, to stop the problem from getting better, I mean, from getting bigger, is, is probably the first thing that we could look at and, and do something uh, that's, that's pretty practical. So all, we probably all have seen it somewhere in our life, the Superman movies, TV show, faster than a speeding bullet. Well, a bullet goes about 1,700 miles an hour. A piece of debris goes 17,000 miles an hour. Anything, a, a cup-sized piece of debris can destroy something really big. And when something gets destroyed in space, it doesn't blow up like we see in Star Wars. It, it breaks up into thousands of little pieces of debris all going 17,000 miles an hour. So stopping that problem, and, you, and there's the, the, the shoot-down thing, uh, the shoot-down scenarios, which is not, a, not really a big issue. It's happened a couple of times. What's more the issue is a satellite that loses control, starts tumbling, it goes from one orbit to another, and in between there's a whole bunch of things that's got to go, like the Frogger game, you've got to cross the street, it doesn't always work. So stop it from making it to getting to that level is the practical side, I think, from, my, from an operator's perspective <coughs> that I can bring back to Copetus and say, that's something we can do. We are doing it, we've shown that we can do it, we can make our planet better, the oceans are cleaner, the air is cleaner than it was when the Space Treaty was put together. That's one thing I think we can do from a practical point of view. And unlike Superman, we don't get a do-over if we have that accident. And, and just, sorry, two other points before we move off of the topic. Um, one, and we find this in really every legal and policy issue, is we have to hit a balance, right? <coughs> that as we talk about you know, reserving a certain amount of fuel or, or transponders or different requirements, you're always then going to get pushbacks from kind of the entrepreneurial side where they don't want more regulations, they don't want 
more restrictions. And the challenge as policymakers is balancing that need for preserving the environment, protecting it, without hurting innovation. And, and that's certainly the comstack the discussions uh, we always get. Second, I think there's a business opportunity here, right? That there's some interesting technological solutions that I've seen to cleaning up the environment. So uh, I think we should always view these things as not only a problem, uh, but a challenge that could actually create a good business case. Yeah, I, but I think there's an element to your question that we, we haven't responded to yet, and that is this argument that is now global about whether small sats, micro sats, nano sats, can sats, I mean they get smaller and smaller, are debris. And, and so it's a very live debate. The more active your country is in space activity, the more likely there will be many voices in your country saying it is debris. But the new countries that are emerging, wanting to get to space, see it as opportunity and access. And so this is one of the things I love about the dream chaser idea, is it does give people a chance to go to space in a controlled object to do serious space work while the next necessary technological change in microsats is being developed, and it's coming very fast, and that's microthrusters. Uh, microthrusters, both based on traditional propellants, which have their challenges, hypergolics, or now increasingly other kinds of propellants, uh, from miniature Vasmir uh, technologies to ion to nuclear electric, I mean all of these things that we're working on would enable us to take a microsat, put it into an orbit, let its operators have a conjunction warning, and let it move. Uh, right now the biggest problem is that so many of the architectures for microsats and smaller don't include uh, maneuverability. Uh, as we add maneuverability, I think we will less and less categorize the smaller satellites as potential debris. Um, and we'll still have the debris problem, but this other political problem of people seeing opportunity and threat in the same object depending upon their <coughs> position relative to access to space um, will start to go away when we can, uh, we can maneuver. And at that time, we will be probably compelled to accept some form of space traffic management. The, the two big issues on, in this that if I were a lawyer in space law, what I would be doing right now, and this is your inside scoop for where you want to practice if you're a lawyer, there's two, two things that are going on. The issue that Mike is talking about is the idea from my perspective of control. Do you exert control over your space asset? It's no different than do you con exert control over your ship at sea. If you do not, it's something that can be salvaged. The control issue is, what is what's going to happen in space. But most importantly, the thing I would do, that we're talking about mining and small satellites, that's not going to be the big legal issue that we're going to run into, in my view, in the next five years. It's going to be privacy. And that's the issue that most of the people I talk to don't even think about. But we, we now have, today, the capability of looking into every one of your backyards every hour. No one is understanding the idea of the, the technology for persistent, uh, exquisite surveillance. Persistent meaning it used to be Google Earth. We've all used it at one point. If you're real estate, you've seen it. Well, it was, it was metered that the images were going to be months old on Google Earth, and that's how they protected privacy. That's not going to be the case anymore. There are going to be images that you can have of any place in the world at any time. So the reaction from countries is, instead of just owning the airspace where planes fly through up to 60,000 feet, we own all the way to, to this uh, solar system. That's what countries are saying. So if you fly over my country, we have the, the right to, to shoot you down. In this country right now, we could take an image of any place, anywhere, every hour. And I'm not just talking about the U.S. government anymore. So look, I look at where the practical reality is. That's one of them. The second one is existing right now. We can go down the street. It's UAVs. It's the same concept. The small satellites and the small UAVs. That UAV, which I own for $400, has a camera on it. I can fly it wherever I want to fly it. And it, there's tens of thousands of those coming online every month. 
that's where, if I were looking at practicing law, I would deal with the privacy issue, I would deal with the ownership issue and the control issue, because those are real-time things that are unregulated right now, for the most part. So I'm going to write a law review article called Paparazzi with Satellites. <laughs> and, uh, and you won't be very far off. That's how it's going. Um, but let me just add a couple points to this. Uh, I, I do. I think space debris is one of the, it's 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 the one issue out there that could deprive us of the use of certain orbits. You know? uh, and it's a very serious issue. And it, and it's and it's techno technology as well as legal. Google the Kessler syndrome. Okay. Don Kessler was a NASA scientist a couple decades ago who developed the theory of cascading collisions. You start some collisions and it just cascades and you have enough pieces of debris in certain orbits, let's say a sun synchronous orbit or something like that, and, and all of a sudden uh, the, the, the potential of collision is so great that you don't want to put a, a new satellite up there. So you could deprive uh, users of certain orbits, which, which makes it very difficult to uh, use certain orbits if you need a sun synchronous orbit or, or something like that. So we really, we really uh, need you know, technological advances there. And hope, again, technology should, should lead the law. Uh, and I never would have thought that two satellites would have Accidentally bumped into each other, and, and it's happened, you know. And, and you know, they, you know, an active uh, iridium satellite that wasn't insured, so it didn't impact the uh, the insurance market. But uh, this stuff's going to happen, and we, we better get ahead of that game. And so, there's a lot of I think it, it would be a great business plan to be able to do that. Then you need a good space lawyer to work out the issues of ownership registration, jurisdiction. And who pays. And, and who pays, yeah. Okay, uh, you, sir. Just a quick question. Cambridge University out of London is, is running a study right now to propose a 50 nautical mile orbital regime for commercial space. Does the Space Treaty get involved in that, the people involved in that? 50 mile orbital regime, 50 miles above the surface yeah, of the Earth? Yes, sir. They're going to lower LEO states where it is. They're going to bring it down to 50 nautical miles above the Earth's surface. Well, the space defi treaty worry about that? definition and delimitation of outer space has been an, an issue forever since the Outer Space Treaty, and there's no legal definition of where space begins. You know, we've generally thought that if you're in orbit, you're in space. Right. Uh, I don't know, going down to 50, 50 miles. 50, 50 nautical miles? miles 50 nautical miles is yeah. Yeah, that's, almost the 60 statute miles. Yeah, that's pretty darn low yes, for yeah. outer space. I mean, I've heard 110 kilometers and things like that. But Mark, you have any thoughts on that issue? Uh, it, it sounds low, but the commercial space companies who are doing tourism right now, of which there are two, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and others that are coming online, the issue of you becoming an astronaut is when you cross uh, an unofficial but relatively official line generally around 100,000 feet, 110,000 feet, uh, you're going to go up to a place where you can claim that you're, you are an astronaut. So I think what they're trying to do is recognize the fact that in that regime that there is a lot of uncontrolled airspace. Basically, there's a gap between the top where we can fly with planes and the high altitude balloons and when we go to space. That, that uh, place of the upper stratosphere in between doesn't have control. So by bringing, I, and I'm being on the positive side, by bringing it down, it actually allows for some control to happen above the place where balloons and airplanes can go at this point in time in, in development. So right now, it's a no man's land. It's sort of an empty, empty area with no regulation. So I might argue that it's, it's not a bad idea either to raise the aerospace law limits or drop the space law limits, but to have an empty gap in between where you can actually do activity these days it's probably not a good idea. I think that's why they're doing it. It's been a 20-year agenda item of the legal subcommittee of Copios to try to come up with a consensus definition of where outer space begins. And until you've heard the debate um, and stayed awake throughout the debate, um, 
it is almost impossible to describe how complex the human mind has made this issue. <laughs> and, and, and understand, for one, there are geopolitical considerations. So certain very large countries, of which you know uh, the United States is one, have not been too eager to have it really clear where outer space is, um, simply because there are certain rules that apply in space, certain rules that apply in the atmosphere, and we'd sort of like to pick and choose in a few cases which rules apply. There's a narrow area. Mark's exactly right. It's a narrow area that's this, this middle zone. There is something that is scientifically closest to consensus, but not complete, called the von Karman line, which is the point at which um, atmospheric lift no longer is possible at any speed. And so, yeah, that works. The problem is it changes because our atmosphere pumps up, pumps down, depending on solar phenomena. And so uh, you can't imagine when lawyers get into talking about those scientific issues, it gets pretty, um, pretty amazing. Um, one of the issues that's emerging, though, in this rapidly changing world is what they call powered flight orbits. Powered flight orbits begin to be possible with certain kinds of propulsion that would enable you to fly extremely low orbits in the 50 nautical mile range where you're really not in orbit in the classic sense because you're having to maintain speed against just enough drag that would have ordinarily pulled you down before you completed a full circuit of the Earth. I mean, an orbit basically is flying fast enough to fly over the edge of the earth before you fall into it. And so um, this area in the middle is beginning to be interesting. And uh, of course, it's particularly interesting to military folks. But it also has some extraordinary research implications. So um, don't count on this being settled immediately. And as Skip, I think, made the point, count on national legislation making the, the decision in the near term about the airspace over their country. Relative to this idea, however, of claiming space all the way into the solar system, uh, the only country I know that's formally done that is Colombia. Do you know of another? Or? Yeah, that's the Bogota Declaration. It was, it was actually all of the equatorial countries. Mike and I were talking about this at the baseball game last night. Yeah. 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 So from the real yeah. world side, space is where you float. And that's that's where it came from. When when do you actually lose gravitational control and effectively are able to move and float without having to go through manipulations as some airplanes do? That's that's where it came from for the most part. And yes, it's I think exactly what you're saying, but maybe Columbia may be the first one to go, but right. it, it's certainly in it's been something that a lot of countries are looking at because of this this issue. The, one of the practical realities of even a spacecraft like Dream Chaser is, is called point-to-point -point travel. Basically, it's you launch in some fashion from the United States, you skirt the edge of space, and you come down somewhere else, which means we, we go around the world in orbit. We go around the world every 90 minutes. So in a day, we see 18 sunrises and 18 sunsets. It's the easiest way to think about it. It's very fast. But in a point-to-point -point travel, there are a lot of people at some point in the future would love to be able to get from Los Angeles to London in an hour and there's a supersonic version of that there's also a way to go up go into the high altitude into the zone we're talking about and then come down the other side and land and that's probably going to even be more practical than supersonic travel at some point in time next question right there um, Alira Salman from 100 Year Starship I have a comment and then a question. First, the comment to Mark, I really love the idea of being conscious about bringing your research back to Earth when you talked about the vegetables and things like that. So we try to do it um, 100 YSS. But my question refers to Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty. And when we start to have astronauts who are now employees of commercial space, and Article 5 says that you have to render assistance, whose responsibility is it when there is distress or some kind of situation where we're starting to cross it's not sovereign nations but the commercial space and they're not officially government astronauts they're really employees of a commercial space endeavor so let me let me paraphrase that question as i understand it so you now have personnel of spacecraft 
employees of companies that may be on, say, a suborbital vehicle uh, or an orbital vehicle, but if, if it returns to the surface of the Earth in the conditions of distress, how would that be handled under Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty? Would it be different than an astronaut returning? Would the uh, rights and responsibilities of members to, the, uh, to that treaty be, be different? Who wants to tackle that? Well, uh, in the words of something that was written 2,000 years ago, do unto others as you would like to have done to yourself. <laughs> uh, and the point of that is, it's, it's from my side as an operator, as a potential a space pilot, if somebody is in distress, you put the flags down and you go help. If I'm on a, a boat and the Titanic's going down, I'm going to go out and try to save people if I can get there, regardless of what the flag is of that particular uh, ship on the ocean. It's, in my view, no different in space. You do what you can do. And if my asset happens to come down in a country that doesn't like me, the hope is that that asset gets returned. And it usually has been that way on Earth, even in very difficult situations. We've seen our, our uh, ships go into Iranian waters, for example, recently. We got the ship back and the people back. Uh, so I think that's the way we view it, is that you have a responsibility in space, you have an obligation in space, and you also realize that therefore, but the grace of God could be you. So would you want to be saved if somebody was, if it was on the other side of the, of the coin? And, that's how we view it, and that's what we would do, commercial flag or not. And I think that's the practical. Now, can it be done is a whole other question. You, unlike the movies that you see where people go flying around space and jump, jump from space station to space station, and somehow uh, there are all sorts of things, the laws of physics and gravity don't apply. You hear sounds and explosions and things, <laughs> things like that don't happen. The answer is it's probably not possible to save anybody in space because the systems are not coordinated. It's, it's theoretically possible, but it's, it's really going to be difficult to do, because everybody has their own design. What you raise is a fascinating question that I think we're struggling with on a number of ways in terms of the responsibilities and obligations that the Outer Space Treaty was set up for states. How much of that flows down to the private sector? And you know, there are attorneys, and I won't name names, but there is at least one lawyer who I've heard talk about who's testified before uh, the House that none of the Outer Space Treaty applies to the private sector, including the appropriation language, and that a private sector company could go to the moon, plant their flag, and claim it for the private sector because they're not a country, and the Outer Space Treaty only prohibits it from countries. So I agree with Mark, and I think I certainly fall down the line with that the Outer Space Treaty, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, that even though you're private sector, ultimately the nation is responsible, and therefore you bear those responsibilities. But I think there is a spectrum of differing opinions in the legal world. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that we, I, I made the point that there is no territorial sovereignty in space, but there is odd personam jurisdiction. And, and you, as a citizen of a country, are subject to the laws of your country. And the Outer Space Treaty makes it clear that those laws are to apply. And I've heard the arguments, too. I mean, a certain person who lives in a cabin in a remote state. Um, but, um, but in fact, uh, the, 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 the treaty pretty carefully makes sure that citizens are, 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 are included. And uh, that's why we argue that the government to legislate, to let the citizens know what their obligations are. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, we, we need to keep in mind going forward that the Outer Space Treaty, um, again, will provide a skeleton, it'll provide a, a, a structure, but uh, it is, uh, it's not going to exempt um, uh, somebody going to, uh, going to the moon claiming it for XYZ Corporation. It's just, just not likely. Can I ask you a question on this just because I'm so fascinated to the answer? Because it's not so much the rescue aspect. Again, you raise a great issue. Uh, you know, I think the rescue makes sense and we would all sign off on that, as Mark says. But doesn't the Outer Space Treaty include visitation capabilities where another nation could go to your private sector moon base? Let's just take an extreme example right. and say you've got a private sector moon base. China wants to go in and inspect that moon base. I mean, there, not only do you have a clash, I think, of private sector versus government interests, but even from an export control perspective, 
you could be violating ITAR while trying to comply with the Outer Space Treaty. Well, in, in, in fact, the Outer Space Treaty does say that as, as, as much as is possible and practicable, one should admit um, inspections and visits from other parties to the, uh, to the Outer Space Treaty, and that there are challenges Part of the argument in the United States is ITAR was passed after the treaty, and in the United States, uh, legislation passed subsequent to a treaty takes precedence over the treaty. It doesn't take precedence over the treaty in international law, however. So uh, you, do have, uh, you do have a real challenge. The one thing I, I, I do want to clarify relative to my thinking uh, about what Mark said um, is that uh, the, the challenges of saving or protecting somebody in space are very, very real. Uh, the challenges for a spacecraft landing where it wasn't intended to land in the United States are the more likely challenges that we have to face. We promised that we would let you know about Lacuna in the Outer Space Treaty, and this is one of them. I mean, there, I do not believe there is anybody who can tell you for sure with a legal opinion Oh, whether or not a private citizen would be treated as an astronaut um, by all the uh, ratifiers of the Outer Space Treaty. I mean, that, that part we just, we just really don't know. We have heard debate where some people say, oh, only public astronauts. The counter argument from the good lawyers is, oh, but everybody authorized to go to space by that person's government becomes a publicly authorized space flyer. That sounds like astronaut. Astronaut. So if you like litigation, you could hope that there is some possibility for this to be litigated. It's not, not such a bad similar idea. Similar to uh, if an airplane had a problem and it had to land in a country that was uh, against the country that it came from. That plane would be given permission to land, it would be taken care of, the people would be taken care of, and it would be sent home. But interestingly, to Mike's point, ITAR doesn't apply in space in my view, and that's going to send shockwaves to my lawyer friends, but ITAR controls the export to a country that you're not supposed to export to. If you're exporting to space, there is no country by virtue of the same treaty that we're talking about. So something that's in space is not actually ITAR controlled, in my view. So I love that view. <laughs> but, 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 so, so let me say this, that ITAR and again, as the rigs are built, not just country to country, but national to national. So even if I'm talking to a foreign national here in this room, I can conduct an ITAR. But it's violation. intentional, meaning that it doesn't cover espionage, it doesn't cover someone who does something without your knowledge, and all you have to do is take reasonable care to protect that yes. asset. So if that person went to my lunar base, and it was a country that we're against in terms of ITAR, first, ITAR doesn't apply. Secondly, I'm not responsible because I can't protect, uh, all I have to do is use uh, reasonable protection against that. Right. Yeah, so I, unfortunately the treaty does say that the person inspecting is supposed to coordinate and consult with you and therefore you could be considered to have well, given they, But if they do it without your knowledge, if they go to well, my satellite without my knowledge, I'm not responsible for under right. right. The, the challenge is, as, as uh, Lyris points out, the, the Outer Space Treaty does provide for this notion where national of a different country could request an inspection and is supposed to consult with you. And so if you then say yes, have you consented to showing off the propulsion system of your lunar lander? I, let me tell you, there's work for lawyers. And yeah, well, the, the past is always the future, so we're actually looking at the, the idea of piracy, mm. which is what this is actually, if you want to think of it. It's no different than people boarding a ship that as they do out in, off the coast of Somalia today, or as they did 400 years ago in the Caribbean. Uh, that's what it is, in effect. Somebody is uh, coming on board something that you own for the purpose of taking something away, whether or not it's intellectual or, or real. It's the same thing. It's piracy. And just to say a word on ITAR in space, which is the worst movie ever. <laughs> Starring Mike Gold. Exactly. <laughs> the first scene at a baseball game. Yeah, <laughs> discussion. So, um, you know, it, uh, this almost goes back to the Bigelow CJ request that we had in terms of if you take a foreign national and even the act of them being a passenger on something like Dream Chaser. And so let me say that back in the day, right, so this is pre-2009, that we were told by department uh, from Director of Defense Trade Controls that if you just took a passenger 
onto a private sector space station, onto a dream station, onto Virgin Galactic, that that would require ITAR permission because just the act of seeing it was actually a transfer of technical information. Now I pushed back on that, and that was the just that was at the core of our commodity jurisdiction request. That we were arguing that just because you fly on a 737 doesn't mean you know how to build a 737. And the Department of State granted us uh, an exception to that, although it was still under the ITAR, and it wasn't until the NDAA of 2013 was passed that we actually got up from underneath that. Um, but still to this day, and NASA has great experience with this on the ISS, that there have been some pretty critical times where NASA has needed to transfer technical information to the Russians, and ITAR has gotten in the way. And I know that there were conversations between the agency and state you know, saying that, look, if you want to prevent me and ISS falls out of the sky, well, then it's on you. And so this has been still problematic. Again, we've made great strides in export control. We will continue to do so, but I think that uh, vigilance is the price we pay for success and freedom, and we really do need to keep paying attention to these issues and how it plays out in the in-space environment. Because one of the great things about space and that I've always been excited as a Star Trek fan is the international nature of it. <coughs> that no one does this domestically. There's always going to be a foreign composite to it, and ITAR can and has been a real barrier to that, so we need to continue to stay vigilant and work. Okay, I have my marketing people pointing to their watches. <laughs> so we're past 10 o'clock, so we're going to have to end the program, but some of us at least will be able to hang around so we can continue this discussion, I'm sure, for quite a while. Uh, it's, it's, it has been great. We have, as you've noticed, we have a professional videographer back here. We've uh, recorded this program, and uh, it will be, um, I don't know how long it'll take to get it from, the position where we can post it on our website will be on our website, maybe on the Secure World website. We'll also give it to, uh, to Mark and Mike uh, to post if they'd like. And but it'll be publicly available, basically. So um, thank you again for joining us, and thank you so much to all our speakers.